delighted to welcome Todd Svensson, partner of Evershed Sutherland, to give us an overview on the characteristics of the Swedish housing market from a legal perspective. Over to you, Todd. My name is uh, Tord Svensson and I'm a lawyer at the uh, global uh, Stockholm office of the global law firm Evershed Sutherland and I joined the firm some uh, uh, 10 years ago and I have since then headed up the uh, uh, Stockholm uh, uh, real estate and real estate finance department. We are advising on all le legal aspects of uh, your real estate throughout the investment cycle, a basically uh, joining you from A to Z. And today I have uh, prepared three uh, uh, brief slides to introduce uh, you to some fundamentals of this residential investment market. And the ambition is also to take you through uh, uh, some key elements of the legal system uh, to, that may be relevant when you prepare and execute your investments in this Swedish market. Uh, the heading of a uh, Today's session the, uh, uh, indicates or, or, or uh, yeah, the indicates that there is a Gordian knot to uh, uh, this Swedish market restraining it. And uh, unfortunately, I will start off by saying that the Lady Justice sword will not be the sort of weapon that you can use to untie that Gordian knot, however. Uh, but the legal system is, of course, something that you should be on top of when you uh, start your investment venture in Sweden. And uh, uh, the first slide of the three I mentioned is uh, uh, basically trying to tell you what we're looking at here, the real estate, uh, the, the residential investment alternatives. There are some uh, 10 million Swedes, and we live, spend our time in uh, almost 5 million homes, and uh, 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 in the country, there's some 5 million dwellings, and those units are split into a bit, roughly over 50% uh, uh, single uh, uh, detached dwellings, and the rest, the other 50%, is multifamily housing. Uh, boiling that down further, half of those ones, no, it's 1 million almost, 0 0.9 uh, million. Uh, uh, goes off in cooperative, housing cooperatives, and that brings us to a rental residential market of roughly 1.4 million units. And the, uh, this uh, multifamily uh, 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 rental dwelling market is dominated by the public housing company, which basically runs half of that stock that I mentioned. And uh, uh, the background of, of uh, this 50-50 split can be basically taken in, in, into three or four political developments taken in the post, or, or starting off in the early post-war stage. The Sweden took a unique path saying that, okay, we will not have social housing in Sweden, which was a, 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 an, an established uh, uh, concept, which in essence provide housing for the less fortunate and exposed people. Sweden took in the post-war war, war area the step of, of, of in introducing a, a concept of public housing. And that public housing complex was based on a, a legislation saying that each Swedish municipality needs to provide adequate housing to its citizens. And that is not only providing shelter, but also political ambition to provide housing that is good and modern and, and improving quality of each individual's lives, basically. This sort of political movement was peaked, I should say, in the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, the Million Homes Program, which in 10 years executed some 1 million homes in Sweden. And that is basically the legacy which we see around every, the legacy of, of that 1 million program. And the rental market in, in this sort of context is also based now on public leasing agencies. Only in Stockholm there were some, some uh, 
these, these public leasing agencies have been in place for, for over 100 years, and only year there were, were some 18,000 dwellings provided or of flats provided through this, this muni municipal system. And the, uh, uh, the product type, uh, uh, residential, is a institutional, very much driven by institutions. There's no mom and pop business there. There is no site of, of anyone sort of placing their retirement money into a, a single individual flat in Sweden. It's all institutions that driving this in the context of, 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 of uh, having these public, public uh, 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 residential companies and also uh, uh, big, uh, uh, what you say, builders who have been, been developing their properties. Parallel, and uh, in regarding the uh, uh, subletting, there could be, of course, a potential market for the zero point nine million condominiums, but those are all restricted. It's not possible to for, for the individual homeowners of the the condominiums to do any proper sublettings. Only for water uh, Okay, and coming on to the investment product. What you see here, you have this existing stock of, of 1.4 million, but there is also in recent years some, some uh, uh, decent new production going on, saying that we have a, a, a peak in 2018 with over 40,000 dwellings, which is the, the highest since the 70s with, and, and the million housing program, which I mentioned at the beginning. So you get built to rent, you get also built to sell, and there is the existing stock. In relation to the special product, Student housing, you see that as well. Co living, not so much. Retired homes is a separate uh, industry where, where you would not uh, the, do the regular investment. And the service and part, the apartments are not very common. On to next slide. Okay. And then saying that is the. Uh, I don't know if this works properly to change to the next Linda. Next slide. Yes, maybe, maybe. Okay, and that brings us from what we're looking at, the 1.4 million dwellings, coming on to what you need to do and need to be aware of when you want to execute your transaction. The basic general information is, the, 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 the basic fundamental of, of Swedish uh, uh, property market is the, that there is information you will always be able to rely on, on, on a, a, a publicly driven land registry. And you can also always rely on the legal system. When there is an eviction, your tenant doesn't pay, you will be able to ev evict them. And there is also a good and, and robust for resolving disputes. I think that is right. Financing is also available. Swedish banks have always been keen on, on financing uh, residential projects. And I know also that we have uh, uh, international banks coming on since several years. In, in the outset, they were a bit restricted due to the regulatory system here in Sweden, but they are now on board also for, for, for uh, uh, housing. Act. The specific what you need to know is that leasing is standardized. The Landlords Association, they, they provide every landlord to the one major which they can use and which also are bright, widespread use as the lease contract for housing. There is also protection of any very strict in favor of the tenants. They can stay as long as they pay the rent. Basically, you need to know that as landlord, everything that, that will effectively make you possible to, to get rid of a tenant is when was the important part of it. Uh, you do a share deal or an asset deal. It, 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 an asset deal, there is always the risk of a, a, a corporate housing organization stepping into the transaction with their preemption right, which is down there on the list. This is for, for, for uh, uh, asset deals only if you do a share deal and with no risk. Uh, forward finance funding, yes, that we mentioned earlier on. The Rent and to, to, to sell segment, they can finance with respect to that uh, 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 in an international sort of uh, uh, context very efficiently and Swedish as well. Jumping on, 
to one of the most interesting topics when you make your real estate investment, how do I get my fund <laughs> improved and how can I get a rent increase? The Swedish uh, 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 rent regulation system was originally introduced with these public uh, 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 housing companies that they are the driver of the rental market. The, the rents are set in in, in, in sort of uh, uh, by these municipality uh, companies, the, the rent they charge and the costs they have, they drive the rent that you as private homeowner may set. And rent, the rent increase is not based on market, but it's based on, based on a utility value. So if your your uh, uh, flats are equipped in a certain way, you may charge a certain rent. If you upgrade, refurbish, renovate, then you can also increase the rent, otherwise not. And uh, any tenant may turn to the local rent tribunal to test the rent. If you as a landlord try and increase the rent more than the market, more than these public housing uh, uh, corporations, then each tenant can turn to the local, uh, the local rent tribunal to get that tried. The uh, uh, sort of touch of market rent in Sweden applies for newly produced stock. If you buy, if, if you can uh, build a, 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 a multifamily house newly produced, then you may apply a higher rent for 15 years. And that is basically throughout Sweden. But at the end of the 15 years, you have the risk that your rent is, uh, your, your uh, uh, rent is being reduced. Uh, basically, short and quick, like a machine gun, maybe. It's, it seemed for some things, uh, Andrea, that would end my presentation, please. It's been really helpful to get that legal perspective as a kind of a cornerstone to what we're going to talk about today. We'll have the market perspective with you in just a moment. <laughs> Thank you very much and welcome back. Um, we're now going to have the market perspective and to give us that guided tour around the key market activities over the past 18 months and what we can expect from the market going forward. I'm going to delighted to um, hand over to Joachim Nordstrom, partner at Nord Nordano. Joachim, over to you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for that introduction and uh, good to be here today. Um, as said, I'll be discussing the Swedish residential investment market, which is a part of the market where myself and I have been very active during the last number of years. And we continue to be active in that space and hopefully we can provide some interesting insights into what we're seeing in the market currently. Uh, so just to start off, I think it's fair to say that the overall interest right now for investments in the Swedish residential segment is at an historical high, uh, perhaps higher than it's ever been. Uh, and we'll get into how that's affecting the transaction market, but before we do that, I think it's relevant to uh, just briefly recap what it is from our point of view that's driving this exceptional interest. And um, in a broader perspective, what we've seen in the market during the last 12 to 18 months is probably best described as a flight to safety or an increased allocation of capital to low risk investments. Uh, and in that market environment, what we're seeing is uh, both the Nordic markets in general, benefiting from an international perspective, uh, but also within the Nordic markets, not least the residential sector becoming highly sought after by an increasing number of investors. And the Swedish residential sector specifically offers a very attractive market dynamic for low risk investments. Uh, we have a significant housing shortage across the country, uh, not only in the major cities, but from north to south really. Um, and also we have a regulated market, which means that there's a high level of stability and predictability built into the system and really a, a high level of downside protection. Um, and with that said, however, and within the same regulatory framework, there's still opportunity also to increase rent levels and to realize potential through active management, investments in properties and apartments. And 
And, and so that combination between downside protection and many times, particularly in the older stock, a, a potential I think is quite unique for the Swedish market. Um, and when we look at historical uh, returns, we will see that the residential sector has delivered very strong risk-adjusted returns over time. And so all in all, I think this is a, a relatively good view of what it is that's driving the interest right now and really feeling that in, in the market. Um, if we look at the transaction data for, for the market, we can see that the uh, activity has remained high in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and it continues to be high in our view it's so far in, in uh, 2021. Uh, transaction volumes uh, last year were at historical levels uh, that go for the overall market, but also certainly for the residential sector. Uh, we recorded, uh, according to our data, somewhere around 60 billion Swedish or 6 billion euros of residential transactions during last year, uh, which is in line with previous four or five years and, and remains roughly 30% of, of the overall market. Um, and so the residential sector is a sizable market, it's a liquid market, and continues to be a big part of overall transaction volumes in, in Sweden. Um, a very clear trend that we're seeing in the transaction market and that we've noted during the last year is, is the increased number of newly built properties or residential development projects in the market. Uh, and that's represented here by the by the dark blue line in this graph. And, and as you can see, that's typically no more than 10, 15, maybe 20% of the overall residential turnover. But during last year, that was upwards of 60%. Uh, so that's a significant increase. And we've really seen a, a, uh, an increasing number of developers turning to the rental housing part of their business and, and divesting projects at relatively early stages. Um, and given the very strong interest that we see in the market, I mean, it, I think it comes as no, no surprise to most of you listening that, that during the, the last year or so, we've also seen a, a significant increase in pricing in the market uh, with a yield compression, I would say, across the entire sector, both for the newly built part of the market, but also for the older stock. Um, but given that there's been a lot of focus on the newly built part of the market, uh, I think that's where we've been able to most clearly observe this development over, over the last 12 to 18 months or so. Um, and that's what I've, I've tried to capture on this slide here, which is um, data from uh, transactions in the Stockholm market with newly built assets uh, during 2019, 20 and 21. Um, and so it's a, it's a relatively small sample, but I still think it captures the development that we're seeing and that we're feeling in the market. Um, and so when we look at this, we can see that um, up until December of last year, uh, we hadn't seen more than one transaction trading in, in the Stockholm market at above 50,000 per square meter. And that was the, um, the leftmost bar in this chart, which, which was in early 2019. And I think uh, many investors and many players in the market considered that a very high level at that time. Um, and for quite some time following that as well, around 50,000 was considered sort of the top level in the market. Following December last year, however, we, we've seen already a handful of transactions above 50,000 per square meter, uh, both in Stockholm, but actually also outside of Stockholm. Uh, and many of these or a few of these have been above 60,000. Uh, and I think we also have reason to believe that there will be additional closings shortly above 60,000 in the Stockholm market. And so... There's, there's a, been established a, a new level, let's say, of, of, of the top market in Stockholm when it comes to newly produced. That's somewhere 20, 25 percent higher than what was considered the top level only a year ago or so. So that's that's a very significant development. And I think what's also interesting when looking, when looking at this data is that most of the top recordings, as you can see here in the in the darker orange um, bars, ha have been driven by international buyers. And we see them very active, particularly in the newly built segment. Um, and, and when we talk to these investors, we feel that they are typically more yield focused and return driven uh, than the domestic buyers who have a longer history of perhaps benchmarking per square meter prices or looking at the private co-op market. Um, and so what we see now is, is international investors focusing on yields and also comparing returns to their domestic markets. And so we might have German investors, for example, saying that. Well, if I can buy logistics in Germany at three and a half percent, then I'd much rather buy residential in Stockholm at the equivalent pricing. And that being said, it's not crucial if the per square meter price is 50 or 55 or 60. 
And so I think that's been a really key driver in pushing the levels, uh, at least in the newly built segment, to, to new highs. Um, another interesting data point, I think, in this context is also the, the development of rent levels in the market. And, and this is not strictly a transaction data point, I'd say, but it certainly has implications for pricing and, and trends and, and uh, strategies that we see in the market. Uh, and so this is uh, an illustration of the development of both uh, rent levels in newly built assets, which is the orange line, orange line, sorry, and um, and for the older stock in the blue lines. And and what we can see clearly is that the development in the newly built segment has been much uh, stronger than for the older stock. Um, I think a couple of things to just to note on that is that first, of course, when talking about record high per square meter prices or capital values in the newly built segment, uh, this development is, is a driver in that as well, combined with yield compression, as we just discussed. Um, but also second, I think this development has been a key driver also for the older stock in the development of what we like to call these sort of active management model and the, the ability to invest in the properties to increase rent levels. Uh, and that is in that when the spread between the rents and the older stock and the newer stock has, has increased, uh, there's been an opportunity to sort of introduce a third option into the market, which has been the renovated apartment, which is an older property uh, with a, an apartment renovated to a newly built standard and where you can negotiate a rent level that's somewhere in between the two. Uh, and so this has really opened up potential, we feel, for sort of moving uh, residential investments from what's typically been sort of a buy and hold passive strategy to actually working actively with increasing rent levels. And that's been a huge driver, I think, also in the appeal of the Swedish market, both for domestic and international buyers uh, during the last number of years. Um, and when it comes to the um, investors active in the market, I think it's uh, it's uh, fair to say that it's a very dynamic market with a very broad investor interest. Uh, we see the residential sector in Sweden in Sweden attracting many indiv individual investors, but also many different categories of, of investors. And I think part of that is because there, there's potential to 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 uh, invest across the risk spectrum, basically, and have different strategies, which which allows for both diversification and specialization within the same market. Uh, part of that is uh, what we touched upon: the the very strong housing uh, demand across the country. So there are local sort of regional geographies that offer certain characteristics and and are investable to to uh, to investors, but also uh, the rent development that we just discussed discussed, which means that in the same market and with the same regulatory framework, we've seen the emergence of different rent levels within the same market. So we have one rent level for the unrenovated apartment to the older stock, and we ha have a second rent level for the renovated apartment, and a third for the newly built, and now we have newly built with investment subsidies, which is a fourth level. And so all of this creates a, a really interesting dynamic and the potential to sort of specialize again and 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 uh, attracts a wide range of different investors with, with different preferences. Um, and finally, I, I think it's interesting to note that um, although it's certainly the case that the market is very competitive uh, and, and we've seen yield compression in the Swedish residential sector and, and the property market in general for that matter over a long period of time, uh, it, it's interesting to note or keep in mind that that financing costs or interest rates have actually come down even quicker during the same time period. And so when we look at the, the spread between yields and, and financing costs, the, the yield gap, uh, that's actually at a historically high level. Uh, and, and so it is possible still, I think, also in not least in relation to, to other markets where this dynamic might look different, uh, still possible in the residential sector in Sweden to, to, uh, to make attractive investments, basically. Uh, so just to summarize briefly, um, our view is that the, the interest is uh, at an all-time high in, in, in the Swedish market right now for residential property. Uh, we see very high activity in that part of the market. We've seen that in the last year and that has continued into, into 2021. Um, we see record pricing, uh, particularly in the older, or sorry, in the newer stock that's been apparent, but I think we also have reason to believe that we'll soon see some, some record prices also in the older stock. A uh, very dynamic market with a, a wide range of investors active. And, and although the market is certainly pricey uh, to some extent and competitive, the, the yield gap is at a historically high level. And, and, and there is potential perhaps for, for yields to compress even further uh, going forward. 
Um, so that's all for me. Thanks for listening. And I'm, I'll uh, hand back over to, uh, to Andrea. Yeah, okay, thank you so much for that. Maybe I can ask you just a quick question, really. You mentioned that we're at historic high levels in terms of pricing. We're breaking some barriers there. You know, this session's looking at the inside and the outside view. Who do you think that's going to affect most, domestic or international buyers going forward? Uh, oh, good question. Well, well, I think uh, what we've seen so far, again, is, is uh, to some extent, at least in parts of the market, uh, the, the international uh, investors being the, the ones that have been paying the, the highest prices. So I think to some extent, uh, I guess, the, the domestic investors feel that, well, we'll hear about that in the coming panels, I guess, as well, but feel that the competition has become even, even fiercer, I guess. So, so uh, it's hard to say who it's going to benefit most, but at the time, uh, for the time being, I think we're seeing a lot of international presence in the newly built sector and, and, uh, uh, and certainly also high interest for, for the older stock. And you mentioned interest rates are obviously still low, which might be good for financing debt on these. Are, um, are players employing debt more on these um, residential portfolios now? Um, I wouldn't say that they're doing it more so than, than previously. I think uh, there hasn't been a significant change in that, but it's certainly the case that, uh, you know, uh, the, the robustness and the solidity of the, of the residential Swedish sector is, is such that uh, it, it's definitely a, a product that, um, that works well for financing and, and banks are, are, um, are very active in the market as well and provide financing in good terms. So, so that's what we're seeing. But I wouldn't say there's a, a sort of clear change in, in, in terms of LTVs or, or using that, uh, that um, uh, compared to previously. OK, well, Joachim, thank you again. Thank you for setting the scene on the market view. We'll be back for our first discussion, uh, panel discussion in just a moment. Now to the first of our panel discussions. This one will be focused on the inside view as we assess the current market from a domestic perspective. I'm delighted to welcome our following panelists. We have Patrick Emanuelson, CEO of Haber Fastigets, Jonas Anderson, CFO of Slato for Boutney, Marlin Rosen, Deputy CEO of Renova, and Andrew Mor Morfiadakis, CEO of Clarabo. So thank you so much for um, all joining us. Now, uh, Patrick, maybe I can come to you. You heard Joachim talk about finding, you know, increased levels of interest, breaking kind of new pricing levels. How are you finding value in the Swedish market at the moment as a domestic investor? Oh, Joachim told most of it, but um, uh, we are very focused on, on uh, to, to get new properties. New pro properties have a, a yield that, that is twice as high as the old properties. Uh, and to make the value of the old properties not renovated, uh, it has been the market value that, that has been increasing for, as I know, the last 16 years. So we had had an average grow about over 6% on the market value every year, the last 16 years. Otherwise, you know that uh, the old not renovated houses are, uh, have a yield that could be uh, less than 2%. So, uh, and uh, if you have uh, properties in, in uh, attractive parts in Stockholm, you have a very high uh, pricing on all properties also. So we cannot really have the same uh, uh, escalating uh, in renovating as you can have uh, having properties with not that uh, same uh, pricing. So, and then, you know, the pricing uh, and uh, the way in the regulated system is that you get the same uh, uh, increase of the rent if you if you do the renovation out in the in the country as in Stockholm. So, for us, it's it's a, a big uh, achievement to uh, get a go, good good uh, uh, result in renovating the old properties. But we will we will have a yield uh, that is better than uh, zero point five percent after renovating. So, new properties uh, twice as high. Uh, yield so new properties and our own land allocations okay so you're going for sorry you're going you're seeing value in older renovations as well then 
Yeah, but not as much as you can see if you if you have properties that it's not in attractive areas because uh, the increase of the pricing on the oil properties has, has been so high, 6% every year the last 16 years. So mm -hmm. uh, you don't have that gap that you can if you if you have buy properties uh, that are not so high priced. So it's the market value that has been the, the good part for, for us uh, talking about the not renovated properties. Okay, that's me able to sustain that. And and Jonas, what do you think um, in terms of whether your preference is for finding value in maybe new or older stock? Well, thank you, Andrea. Thank you for having me on this panel. Um, from my perspective, I would say that there's definitely value to be created both in old and new stock. And in new stock, I would say that the driver value in is coming in either early in, in development stages, uh, potentially buying in a forward structure and also focusing on strong and growing geographies with continued potential for, for rental growth in the long term. And when it comes to old stock, it's much like Patrick said, that it's about active property management and also investing in the real estate to improve NOI and hence drive values. And you could do that not only in, in the strongest of geographies in Sweden, but also uh, in the remote cities. Okay. And um, do you think international activity is affecting pricing in either of those areas? I mean, I feel like a, an international buyer would probably like to come in and buy newer stock. That would be where the competition would be. Well, I, I think that Joachim had a lot of excellent points on this subject. And as he pointed out, I think it's clear that the international investor demand has been driving pricing for some time, uh, both in terms of old and new stock. And I think there are obviously many reasons for this, uh, one being that the Nordics in general, and perhaps Sweden in particular, is perceived as somewhat of a safe haven. We have the liquid transaction market in the European context and in addition, uh, the rent mm. regulation of the residential market is perceived as, as stable and foreseeable. And, and that refers to time for a long time has been a significant supply demand offset in, in terms of, uh, of residential for rent. But when it comes to how this affects the domestic players, I would say that to some extent it takes a little time for domestic players to keep pace with the current price point in the market. Uh, both in terms of all, but in particular when it comes to new stock, where, as Joachim said, 60 uh, being the new 50 in terms of PSM pricing. Uh, when it comes to the old stock, I, we, we saw first wave of, of platform acquisitions, basically starting with Blackstorm acquiring the majority position in the Carnegie in 2016, and hence Venovi acquiring Hemla uh, last year. And that was a game changer in terms of price for the old stock. Uh, my, my sense is a bit that the price element for the old stock has stabilized somewhat, uh, whereas the price point obviously for new stock has continued to increase. And I think all other things equal, all the stock would require more from a local team to manage. Uh, it's a difficult, as, more difficult asset type to manage in order to generate value to invest actively in, in that stock. And for international players without a strong platform, I think that acquiring new builds is, is easier and probably more about allocating capital to, to this attractive segment. And I think this the second wave, if you wave, if you will, of international buyers is is driving pricing. Um, for mm -hmm. domestic buyers to be competitive again, I think it's about all about using that local knowledge yeah. to make the right acquisitions coming in early in development, using your local relationships to, to uh, generate off-market transactions. Uh, and when it comes to older stock, again, I think actually that domestic players are, are quite well placed to be competitive, largely because of the advantage of being local, understanding local demand, and, and sort of being able to manage and develop assets in a more efficient manner. And, and also perhaps being able to move out a bit on the risk scale in terms of geography, not only focusing on the major metropolitan areas. Yeah, and I think Marlon, maybe I can come to you about, you know, being outside Stockholm. Is that one way to avoid the competition? Are you finding value in some of the cities outside the capital? 
Uh, we are experiencing a greater con uh, competition in acquiring uh, residential properties and actually community properties uh, uh, in the smaller cities like Skure, Bjuv, Svedala. Uh, all cities that are, are small but they have good public, uh, offer a good public uh, transportation opportunities and they have a good infrastructure. Uh, and it is fascinating to see the yield getting lower and lower and even uh, at a faster pace uh, as it is in the larger cities. Uh, but it is, uh, I think, yeah, where we can find a good value is the smaller acquisition, uh, just as Jonas was talking about. I mean, we are in the market, we can find the small ones that can complement our existing portfolio and, uh, and contribute to an effective property management. Uh, but for larger acquisitions, uh, uh, especially we see the same competition in the smaller cities like Landskrona and Eslöv as we do in Malmö. So we, we, to be able to grow in a profitable way, we have to do our own project development, get in early in the project uh, <clears throat> to be able to to, to, to raise some uh, profit. profit. Now we're, seeing a, we're seeing a lot more people maybe move to cities outside um, Stockholm. I wonder, is it the same affordability for them then? Are there challenges in sort of creating a product that works for you, but also works on the affordability side for them, likely expecting slightly lower, lower prices outside the capital? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and we have this uh, rent regulation system that the, the older stock is based on utility value system and, and the only way I mean, demand won't raise the rate the rent on the properties but uh, we do some uh, rent increase uh, renovations on our properties but we have to make early investigations to, to identify the ideal rent because the ideal rent where the vacancy risk doesn't uh, in increase or an and the ratio of uh, the relocation doesn't uh, get any higher isn't always the same as if you do a full rent increase renovation so uh, and w with people moving out maybe that will, won't be uh, as necessary you can do the full rent increase renovations so you think those the potential for those markets might change if this we see continue to see more migration out of the major cities mm -hmm. Yeah, and then for the new projects as well, where you can put the presumption rent that uh, stays for 15 years, and there you can uh, uh, gain some more and get some more for affordability, absolutely. But you have to develop those projects yourself because there is quite some competition for um, those. Andreas, I wonder if you can give us your view on the sort of those, the cities outside Stockholm, whether you feel they, they offer you value or whether you struggle with affordability. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> the market is still uh, quite good uh, outside the major cities uh, and and, um, uh, <clears throat> um, and the reason for that is, is mainly because of the competition. The competition is, is, is much less uh, outside the major cities. So, so you can still get some decent uh, uh, yield transactions there. Uh, uh, of course, it, it, it does have... Uh, um, the vacancy risk is a little bit higher outside uh, the major cities, so so you need to be in control of that when you work with the refurbishment uh, uh, program. But but uh, I mean the, the housing deficit is, is huge and the de de demand is huge even outside the major cities. So so I mean both the um, the area of uh, refurbishment and and uh, new construction is uh, is highly uh, demanded outside the. Um, Stockholm, Gothenburg, and Malmö. And what do you think you have to demonstrate as a player to be sort of successful in those markets? What are the ingredients to success for you? Now, I think Jonas uh, was uh, uh, quite right when he said that that you need to have a strong local management uh, uh, that actually knows the market uh, very well, and 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 that you have a, an active property management on on site. Uh, uh, I'm. I'm. I don't think uh, a lot of the uh, um, uh, the international institutions are, are actually uh, can can uh, can offer that. So so um, that's why competition is a little bit lesser outside the, the major cities. But but uh, of course the uh, if you have a local management, it is much easier to find some kind of uh, off market deals, which uh, uh, which will be. 
uh, one key uh, way to actually increase or, or, or making the transactions ahead. Okay, and um, Patrick, do you see that wave of capital that uh, Jonas talked, sorry, that Joachim talked about, kind of seeing international buyers coming out of Stockholm? Do you see that they will actually now sort of threaten other territories that you may be working in? Absolutely, but we have we have uh, our a lot of own properties and we we get the same uh, increase of the value. So in that we are not a loser anyhow. So so I think. Uh, it's possible for us with the low interest and uh, the increasing of the, our own properties, uh, we will be in the game and uh, uh, could get a good competition with the uh, uh, buyer from the abroad. Okay, and, and Marlon, do you do you agree that that's you're going to get more competition in those markets going forward? We will, but uh, I think we have to look at the need for having a local management. You can't manage uh, these properties from from abroad. So I think as long as we are in our market, we have a big advantage uh, in finding off market, uh, but also making value of the actual properties that we own, keeping the value for a long time. Okay, and, and Jonas, maybe I can ask you just about the dynamics of the market. You have a housing shortage. There's a lot of interest in this. Are we meeting, are you able to meet the demand that there is there? Or is there anything that's kind of stopping you doing that? I, I think in, in the growth regions and in metropolitan areas, we're not close to meeting the demand. It's, it's been such an underinvested segment for such a long, long time. Uh, I think what you have to be mindful of as an investor is when you push the, the geographical scope a bit and go out into some, some of the regional cities, you'll find that the rental market is more in balance. You don't have the, the, the queue time that you have for the rental apartment in, in uh, per se, Stockholm. Uh, that, to some extent, sort of caps the rent potential if you were to actively work on refurbing and, and, and investing into an older stock type of of, uh, of real estate. Yeah. And, and Andreas, um, when you look at kind of um, investment into residential property, how does it, I mean, when we think about residential, it's become a merging sector across Europe. But it's kind of got lots of competition at the moment, you know, industrial kind of, you know, not offices so much, but lots of different types of residential. Is that the same in Sweden? Is there actually institutional appetite for other sectors that are competing with residential? Sorry, can you just repeat the question because it was lagging a little bit here in the end. Oh, sorry. Yes, we've got a few technical issues today. I, I suppose I'm asking about the competitive, you know, the attractiveness of residential as a sector versus other sectors in Sweden at the moment. How does it sit against maybe logistics, which, you know, with the pandemic and e-commerce is going quite wild everywhere else? Uh, I think the competition in the uh, housing sector has been has been quite high for the last couple of years, uh, uh, and and I think it, um, uh, just the, the housing segment is a few years ahead of uh, other areas as uh, like uh, logistics. So so I think uh, uh, I mean the competition is is strong and uh, and I, for sure it's going to be strong for quite some time. And and like I said before, I mean if you um, for us, a small company outside the major cities is, is I mean, we can't even go close to uh, buying anything in the major cities. That's why we're in the smaller cities. And, and so we can still get some kind of uh, 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 good yield uh, as, as, as now. So, so um, uh, um, what, I, what I hope I would see is that the competition actually move outside the major cities to, to the smaller cities, because if that happens, that is going to be a main risk for, for some of the companies that are worked outside the regional cities. Yeah. And Patrick, maybe the same sort of question to you. Do you see other sectors rivaling residential and investment? We might see some investment flows go to logistics or even to offices. No, I think we will see logistics, of course, but uh, I think uh, from offices and from retail will come uh, into our market. So uh, for a lot of years ahead, I think uh, our competition will be increasing. Absolutely. 
Yeah. And, um, and Jonas, what, what's your views on that? Do you think you're actually going to see more capital increasing in flows into the sector rather than less, that this is kind of an unstoppable force in a way? Well, well I think there's, there's nothing that is unstoppable in life, but I think that the, the segment, effectiveness of the segment is sort of here to stay for, for some time. And I don't see in, in sort of in the, in the near to medium future that we have any reason to believe that the sector would attract less capital. I rather think it would be more. But having said that, as you, as you said, there are other sectors such as light industry, logistics, that are also quite an investor demand. But I think that the, the, the risk return fundamentals of the rental risky in Sweden is, is strong and will remain so in a foreseeable future. Um, what do you feel for the markets, Jonas, overall, you know, prospect wise for the next year or so? Do you see activities level increasing um, and, and what risks do you see to that? I, I do think that the level of activity, which is already high, will continue to increase. Uh, again, we, we continue to see a strong influx of of uh, uh, international cap capital trying to find investment case into Sweden, not not only in in RESI, but also across other sectors. I think that will increase. But but uh, uh, in and in terms of risks, I mean, obviously, we see some some tendencies of inflation here and there, and that would be one potential risk for 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 the for the real estate sector as a whole. Uh, that could be. I think that's that's one. Uh, is on everyone's radar. Uh, otherwise, the supply of of debt, uh, both from capital market but also from the banking system, is is, is strong. So, I think we're looking at, at a strong transaction year with uh, with additional activity. Uh, Marlon, do you would you agree with that? A strong transaction year ahead of you, and and what do you feel the the risks of that might be? I do feel it's going to be a strong transaction year ahead as well. Uh, the risk I see is that there are a lot of new projects coming up, new apartments being built, and 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 sometimes maybe too fast. Uh, I, mean, I, I can see some indications of a strong to a property owner in Växjö, and that is the capital of the county Småland uh, and has its own university. And he was telling me they had to give uh, discounts on the rent to get uh, all their uh, all their apartments rent rented out, the new apartments. And that, for me, indicates that uh, there is you have to choose your market and uh, where you do your develop, developments to, 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 aid, to be able to get the rent you want you uh, that you have been calculating on. Yeah, so that, that might be some concerns about pockets of oversupply then rather than mm -hmm. an oversupply in the whole market. No, there, there is a defect of housing. So that's definitely but, the, the, uh, but uh, on isolated places, they can be too much. Yes. Yeah. Andreas, would you agree with that? Do you have concerns about um, different pockets of the market actually oversupplying? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Marlene is quite right. Um, um, especially when it comes to, I mean, a city like uh, Vecro, where I mean, we are seeing that there is a lot of newly built apartments that, that they're having. Constructors are having a, a very difficult to, to, to rent it out. And, and, and in some way um and one reason for that is 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 basically because of the rent is way too high i mean uh, uh when you come to cities outside the uh outside stockholm i mean you have to adjust the 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 rent per see some of the the newly built uh, apartments around the country mm -hmm. the rent is way too high and that's why they're having some uh, um, some kind of increased uh, vacancy risk there uh, so i mean that is, that is definitely so go on sorry <laughs> No, no. I mean, so that that is definitely a risk. But but uh, I think if you have a, 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 a solid and local property management, and you actually know what kind of demand and what kind of a, 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 a what kind of amount people actually can pay uh, for 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 an apartment, um, there is still a lot of value to find outside uh, uh, the major cities when it comes to new construction and uh, refurbishment apartments. Yeah, and um, Patrick, finally, is that a major? Con is there, are there other types of concerns in the larger markets, or is it? You know, I, I'd imagine it's not going to be oversupply there. If there's any other risks, it might be something else. No, I think it's um, as uh, Andreas says. It's the the high price of the the newly built properties that could be a risk because it, it is very high, and and uh, 
it's too the difference between the old reno, old properties and the renovated properties and uh, the new properties the gap is too too wide uh, and I, get, I think um, that that's that is, is a risk if you're not working in the uh, Stockholm city or so but I think even there it is uh, you have a limit how okay. high the new can the new rents could be yeah, I, I feel like there's there's an issue around rental levels, basically, which is a you know an affordability issue that Marlon you touched on earlier. So, Patrick, does that mean that you kind of you think there'll be more activity in the larger markets and people start worrying about whether they can achieve those rents? If if you have rents uh, as in Stockholm over two thousand uh, per square meter, uh, uh, of course you will have that. If you have the possibility to, to uh, take loans and, and get uh, a tenant-owned property, of course you will get that. But if you get out in the in the country, you, I think if you if you have a rent in two thousand, it will be a problem. So you need mm -hmm. to to work with that. But as I said, and and uh, we have heard, you have this other market with renovated properties, and the renovated properties is about five hundred per square meter lower rent and they are as new ones after are renovated so i think this uh, investment support that that is coming from from the government is is important in the long run to to make uh, the market work all over sweden yeah it sounds like adding value to those older properties is where you're going to find that value in the market at the moment yeah the biggest problem with the rented market is that the not renovated properties has too low rent and uh, that's a problem that uh, nearly no one talks about but i think that's the big problem because everyone wants those apartments and a few very very few have them okay well it sounds like there's going to be plenty of capital coming in to maybe help renew those properties so um patrick jonas uh, marlin and andreas i'd like to thank you very much for giving us that mm -hmm domestic perspective. We're going to put some of those questions to um, an international player in just a moment. Thank you. So thank you to that um, panel for their in insights on the domestic side. So we've now going to have some insights into the international mindset here in Sweden. So I'm pleased to welcome Per Eklund, CEO of Victoria Park and Hembla. Per, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Nice to be here, even if it's a, dig a digital meeting. Yes, I'm afraid we're getting used to very much this virtual pr presentation. So can you just tell us a bit about the company to give us, understand that international perspective that you're able to give us today? Yes, of course. We uh, prefer, uh, uh, we like Sweden, uh, first of all, because it's very transparent and we like the re regulated market and uh, actually the amount of uh, residential uh, Rental apartments in Sweden is quite big, so, so that's the main driver for us why we, uh, Sweden is so interesting. Okay, and can you just tell about the background of your company? I understand it's got a German owner, so that just gives us that. Yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yes, we're, we're owned by by uh, Venovia, and uh, Venovia is uh, the biggest re uh, residential uh, company in Europe, actually, and they have four hundred thousand apartments in Germany. And since uh, three years ago, they decided, uh, we decided to uh, enter Sweden and we started with uh, Victoria Park and then Hembla, as we have talked about uh, before now, today. Okay. And, and what I know about the German market is they have an extremely large regulated market as well. So what do you think, why, why has um, that company come here and invested in you? Uh, two reasons. Uh, they are are extremely big in, in Germany. So if you would like to be bigger, you have to expand. And uh, since the uh, German market is regulated, and we like that, uh, and that's why we wanted to go to Sweden. 
And of course, because of Sweden is a very transparent market as well. But we like regulated markets because it's predictable uh, and it's stable. Okay. So it doesn't, it, you don't have concerns about the sort of government involvement in the market. In actual fact, that's a plus for you in terms of that regularity of income. At the first view, it could be a problem. Mm. But if you look at Sweden, uh, there are so many apartments owned uh, by the municipalities. So you're almost uh, in the same situation as the municipalities. So they, they have to, to handle this market quite carefully. Now, you've heard um, our domestic panel talk very much about being on the ground, having the asset management. How do you compete with that as an international buyer? Uh, you, I think you have to buy a, a company. So you will have to, you, you, because you really need the local management. So you, you can't sit in Berlin or whatever and try to, to manage a resi company in Sweden. You have to be on the ground. Mm -hmm. And is this a market where you're looking for a core return or kind of what would be your investment approach? I think many residential markets have experienced quite a lot of private equity coming into their, into their markets expecting very high returns. What's the risk appetite from your side? Uh, Yes, of course, uh, that could be a way to look at us, but, but, but uh, I think uh, the difference is how we act. Uh, and uh, if we have uh, 400,000 apartments in Germany, we are not uh, looking for exit because our job is to keep the properties and, and keep the apartments. So, so we are, <clears throat> from our point of view, uh, we have a totally different uh, approach. Can you tell us more about that then? Yes, if you look at us, we are a, we are a resi company, first of all. Mm -hmm. We are not private equity, we, we are a resi company. So our, our job is to, to manage our apartments and have a good return from that, not have a good return from exit. Mm. And do you, okay, so it's really about, again, back to that stability of income and not a capital return from a quick sale in that way. But, um, but you must want to add value somewhere. I mean, how do you take a value-added approach to the projects that you have? Yes, we would like to add, add value, and that's very important for us. And I agree with uh, Patrick when he says that it's a very, very low yield uh, on, on uh, old properties. And that's why we have chosen uh, B location, not A locations. We have choos chosen B locations, but in what we call it A cities instead. Okay, so you're in the big cities, but you want to be in kind of more suburban markets. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then we, of course, we renovate. But another thing we also like in Sweden is that uh, the heating and uh, water and so on is included in the rent. Mm -hmm. And since we are buying old properties, normally there is a lot to do. And then we can have yeah. a, a value increase even from that. Yeah. And then Patrick talked about those opportunities being in older buildings that need renewing. So is that where you're mainly focused as a company? Yes, we can focus on, on, on uh, the rents, of course, but we can also focus on the costs for, for utility cost, the cost for, for one example. And, okay, so that and, and I think we are, if we are good at that, we will have a, 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 a return from both sides, and that would be uh, very good for the NY. Okay. And in terms of like being an international investor in a market, you often don't get the off market deals. You don't see the, the inside track as it were. How do you keep up with the domestic players? Are they one, one step ahead of you sometimes? No, because we are in Sweden. We are 500 suites in Sweden running our, okay. our properties. So that's why it's very important to buy an existing company because you can't sit in Berlin and manage uh, uh, Sweden, for one example. You have to be on the ground. And you have to be, mm. you have to be be run by Swedes. Yeah, and and if you think more generally about other international buyers in the market, I wouldn't expect you to name any. Do you see others taking a different approach where they are sort of trying to parachute in and maybe do that from a distance? Yes, and they they will have some problems. And we, and we if if we go back to the nineties, the Swedish company who, who had the toughest times that was a Swedish company who entered Germany and try to manage it from Sweden. Mm -hmm. So of course, it, it's always, you, you need to be in the market very uh, locally. 
-hmm. it doesn't matter in which country we're talking about. And are you, you, are you also looking at new build opportunities? Again, that seems to be a flavour of the month for many players. Yes, we do that uh, as well, but, but uh, we only do it, do it uh, as a densification in uh, our own properties. Okay, so, we, so you, yeah. we, we don't try to, to buy land because if we buy land, the seller of the, the land are normally quite clever, so, so they will put a price on the land so we will end up in a more or less same situation as just buy a, a newly built uh, property. And, and do you feel the same pressure that domestic buyers do in terms of the capital flows and the competition that you're seeing? Do your German owners suddenly start to think, well, this is getting quite a hot market? Yes, I do. I think uh, every year I think that we're coming to a new platform. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, let's see how, for how long time it will continue. But uh, yes, it's, it's been more and more expensive. Yeah, and do you see those prices as sustainable? I mean, Joachim mentioned hit, hitting new benchmarks in the last year. That sixty is the new fifty, I believe, is the phrase for stock, uh, Stockholm Resi at the moment. The first view is that it's crazy, but then when you start thinking about it, it's not so crazy because, as Joachim said, the bond market is also in that some way crazy. So, so you you don't pay so much for the money. Mm. So if you think of that, no, I think it's quite reasonable. It's never cheap, but it's reasonable. Yeah, but there has to be a moment where you think, okay, that's not sustainable anymore. But if we're getting to a 70 or something, then, then presumably things might start to change. Every year when we come to the new platform. <laughs> No, what? Yeah, everyone says it can it can carry on, and I suppose that interest rates again would be another aspect that might that might if they start to go up, that might change that scenario, right? Yes, of course. Yeah, and um, what what are your what do you feel your prospects are? What will we be focusing on as a company in the next year as an international capital in the market? Uh, this year and next year, of course, we would like to grow, uh, but we will also focus on on uh, property management. Mm. We have 38,000 apartments in Sweden and uh, we are not uh, in A locations. So we really have to be uh, good at managing our properties. Okay. Because we, we, are, we renovate and the rents are not the, the lowest. So we need to be really good because we don't like vacancies. Is there the same issue that we talked about with Marlin about kind of affordability when you move? to those locations that actually it's more difficult to, to get the rents that you want. Yes, but we would like to have the high rent but add other values so that we can have the rent. Uh, so so the, uh, our tenants feel that they will get, uh, it, it's affordable. It's not cheap, but it's still affordable because it, the, the location is good, the service is good uh, and so on. And you think that, that, so the value for money is there for the tenants? Yes. Yeah. And, and what about other international players? Do you think we're going to see a rise of capital flows? Other other companies coming in, buying platforms like similar to what you have, what's happened here? I think at least many will look at it because Germany is a really, really big market in Europe. Uh, and after what happened in uh, Berlin uh, with the rents, I think... Uh, a lot of companies will at least look for other countries. Do you mean that's because Berlin tried to impose the rent um, freeze, I think it was, or, yes. or the fact that that got rejected in the end? It didn't end up like that, but, but I think it, it, uh, still it, it will uh, infect the market. It, it worried investors, didn't it? Yes. That there, there could be a political angle to their investments, but you feel that's not, not of concern in Sweden? No, I don't think so. We will always have the debate. But I don't think so. And the, the main reason is that the municipalities in Sweden owns so much apartments by themselves. OK, so there's always a market there that they need to control because they have a large portion of it. Yes. Yeah. OK. All right. Well, that's really interesting. Per. Thank you so much for giving us that um, international perspective. It seems to me that the the I'm not going to call it a battle or fight, but the kind of the. Um, you know, the, the market activity between those two sides is going to continue. So I think it's been a really fantastic session today. I want to thank all the um, panelists that we've had and um, all our speakers this morning for giving us, you know, a good foundation of what's happening in the market and then giving us that really
strong perspective, perspective from domestic and international sides. So, and that's the end of our program today. I would like to encourage you to look out more what Fragaloo is doing in the future and the many events that they're going to have coming up. And for now, I'd like to uh, wish you a very good afternoon. So thank you very much for joining us today.